Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation. Considering cannabis is a traditional crop, it is presented by Gia Fazio, PhD, an independent consultant supporting the agricultural biotechnology industry. My name is Judy O'Rourke and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fazio. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Judy, for that introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and listening to my presentation. As Judy mentioned, I am um, coming from the agricultural uh, biotechnology industry. And so I'm thinking about uh, cannabis in a perhaps different light than some people might be thinking about it today. And so I just kind of wanted to provide an overview of uh, a, a new perspective on thinking about cannabis um, in that perspective. So just a brief overview of my presentation. First, I'd like to talk about the cannabis industry, um, both as in terms of a market and also its um, exponential growth that it's currently experiencing, and then move into the agronomy of cannabis. How is it uh, being grown currently? Um, and what are the regulations associated with that growth process? And then I'll move into key market initiatives um, related to plant health and, and, and uh, regulations and also the marketability of those products. So how, how currently is the cannabis industry looking at um, the opportunities in a different light than they had been in the past? And then wrap up with um, some potential areas of improvement, kind of my perspective and my spin on, you know, what better, uh, what, what are there better ways that we can be producing this, this plant and what are um, some new opportunities that we consider as we go forward. So the cannabis industry, um, no one would argue, I believe, that it is experiencing absolutely exponential growth in the United States. And what's uh, really interesting about it, however, is um, the various stakeholders that are involved. So if you think about the agricultural biotechnology industry, um, you see some very traditional investors um, looking at perhaps investing at a farming level or perhaps at a seed uh, production level and seed identity pr preservation. With um, the cannabis industry, it's a little bit different. So um, you have those traditional investors who are looking up and down the value chain, um, but there are also some investors who are not necessarily thinking about it in terms of um, they don't really want to be associated with perhaps um, the aspect of uh, consumption. They want to be a little bit further away from that and look at perhaps the testing or uh, extraction and, and the marketing and, and be a little bit distant from the consumption part of it. And we'll talk about why that is um, throughout the talk. Um, so also, you know, the regulations currently are state by state. And so that's both a, an opportunity and a challenge. Um, it's a challenge in that, um, you know, there's um, some limit on those multi-unit businesses that are or farming uh, opportunities that are limiting that growth potential. Um, but on the flip side of that, there's a, a lot of um, legalization and decriminalization associated with with cannabis, both for medicinal and recreational use. And so that's spurring a lot of that growth. And then, as I, I mentioned, um, at the farmer and operator level, the people who are actually growing the plants, um, that permitting process is currently, no matter what state you're looking at, it's, it's fairly tightly regulated. And as a consequence, um, you're seeing a lot of people becoming either permit experts or multi-unit experts who are um, prim the primary permit holders within their state and opening up multiple businesses within their region. 
And then some new avenues where um, there has been some um, recent investment and, in, you know, looking at the cannabis uh, headlines these days um, and, and actually not just related to cannabis, but agriculture in general, um, a new avenue is soil health. And I think from, an, from uh, my agricultural background, this is a really great opportunity. And, and so I'm so glad to see this being an area that cannabis growers and and investors are looking at because I, I believe um, there's a lot of research that can, you know, it, it's just beginning. There's a lot of research that can still continue and that will provide enormous benefits, not just to the cannabis industry um, alone, but to agriculture in general. And then, uh, you know, there's this um, uh, investment in rootstocks and identity preservation. You know, if you think about um, wineries, they have been doing this for decades and, um, you know, uh, and also in, in fruit and, and stone fruit trees as well. And so um, we're seeing kind of what might not be necessarily traditional for what I'm thinking of cannabis as a, a simple plant, um, but looking at that rootstock and how that can be improved. And that will bring also a number of benefits to agricultural biotechnology in general as well. And then the cultivation practices. And so I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, you know, it's a little bit uh, perhaps uh, premature and immature in the cannabis industry, whereas the agricultural bio industry is gonna bring a lot of um, ideas and process to the cannabis um, market. So to talk a little bit about that, that market, um, so the CAGR projections in 2017, it was an $8.5 billion industry and it's projected to grow to $40 billion by 2023. And when I looked at this uh, just a year ago, the same report a year ago, um, the annual growth rate was actually only around 20 to 25%. And so even in the last year, you know, we were talking about that exponential growth a little bit ago. I mean, even the last year, it's, it's already increased by 10%, the projected annual growth. And of course, we know that's coming from um, both the medicinal and recreational um, legalization across multiple states, but also, um, like we were talking about before, the decriminalization. So what are those market impacts that we can expect um, as we go forward? Well, as I said, um, you know, it's regulated state by state, and many of you probably already know that. Um, but, you know, because cannabis um, for the THC con content it's still considered a uh, class one drug. And so there are a lot of uh, federal roadblocks that are associated with um, the expansion of this market. However, on a, as a counterbalance, there's been um, a decriminalization. And so there was a, um, the Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General James Cole put forth a memorandum um, during the last administration that deprioritized that criminalization aspect and looked at um, perhaps either not being as punitive or, or, or eliminating the uh, restrictions altogether. However, in, during the current administration that was uh, rescinded um, and with the acknowledgement that the states still have um, complete control and it's regulated at the state level and that we need to look forward at the uh, federal policy. And I, I believe that this will continue to be a challenge um, and something to be uh, investigated further um, as, we, as the cannabis industry continues to grow, perhaps not in the next five years, certainly because um, the growth that we're experiencing is independent of any regulations at this point or federal regulations at this point, but it is kind of a roadblock that will need to be considered long term. And then a, a kind of perhaps not um, uh, a surprise, there's going to be enormous amounts of competition. There already is. Um, you know, I talked about the, the permit holders are mostly um, restricted to a handful of people. Like those permits are very difficult um, to obtain both from a, a farming perspective as well as a dispensing um, um, permitting process. Um, and so, you know, you're seeing a surge in um, people who are becoming experts and the kind of the go-tos for those processes. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so thinking about security and handling of the product, um, again, it's still a class one drug. So it's, it's, it's an issue for, um, producers to manage their product. I actually have a colleague who's working in the industry um, directly with a, with a um, direct market um, producer and the throughput is so is coming through at such a speed that they're challenged with um, things that might be less familiar to 
um, a, perhaps a market that's more mature. So if you have an immature market like the cannabis industry, they're not used to dealing with high throughput, high demand, um, multi, you know, high, high units of business, whereas they're already seeing that it, it's kind of, um, they're literally putting the cart before the horse where um, there are, um, uh, there's such a high demand that they're almost just trying to get it out the door as fast as they can. And they're being challenged with some of those production opportunities, handling, um, you know, the handoff between different parts of, of the value chain. And so this is something that will need to be continued to uh, be cleaned up um, as the cannabis industry continues to grow. And another area that's spurring that growth or multiple areas that are spurring that growth, um, if you think about it, just simple real estate and, and construction opportunities. So now you have um, these uh, dispensaries popping up throughout uh, multiple states where it's become um, legalized. And so there are, there's creating a huge job market, both from not just for real estates, but also for the employment of those people who might be building out those, those stores or the greenhouses or the warehouses that are um, pr providing the material. And while the primary part of um, the majority of the, of the uh, market, if you will, is still focused on either smoking or vaping the uh, cannabis leaf product and bud product, there has been this surge of interest into the extracted oil from the cannabis plant as well. And so this is being incorporated in multiple ways, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but that, of course, is providing a lot of that $40 billion anticipated growth. Um, and then, of course, the revenue projected is to be an enormous number. So it, it's, it's what's really great about all of these numbers is the investment and interest in the cannabis industry. And so if you think about cannabis as simply a plant, um, it's going to provide a lot of opportunity going forward. So, you know, here I am talking about how cannabis is like great and wonderful and everything, um, but really it's a plant that's been around for thousands of years. It's, its Latin name um, roughly translates to fragrant cane, and that's coming from those, those terpene products. So THC and CBD and other metabolites of, of the plant are actually coming from terpenes. So the same thing that makes oranges smell like a nice orange or, or a lemon that smells, that gives that characteristic um, lemon smell, those are all metabolites of, of terpenoids. And so uh, not surprisingly, that's how it's got its name. Um, we're all familiar with the medicinal and recreational uses. However, now that they are doing more research, they're finding other opportunities, um, both in textiles and paper products um, and lotions for uh, various um, anti-inflammatory or skin conditions. Um, but perhaps something that we don't think about very often are um, the potential opportunities for both as a feedstock Right? It's still a plant It produces a protein that can be very useful to um, livestock. And also um, it's a fibrous plant. After you extract what you might want, the, the leaves, the buds, the oil, there's still a, quite a bit of fiber left. And there are going to be um, lots of applications looked at um, for opportunities to use, use, it, uh, use the plant completely. So like I said before, cannabis really is just a plant. So let's compare it to um, feed and, and row crops. Well, those crops re require light, water, and nutrients. So does cannabis. Um, plants are sessile organisms, um, and so is cannabis. So this is, a, you know, in the agricultural biotechnology industry, there is interest and in research in perhaps upregulating a certain gene or breeding to bring out um, a desired quality in that plant, um, you know, eventually the plant's going to balance itself out and uh, because it can't move, it can't get up and go get more water and it can't get up and go get more nitrogen that it's going to need to grow. So um, because there's going to be such an investment in understanding cannabis as a whole, this is going to turn in turn support the uh, feed and uh, row crop industry. Um, Traditional crops are, require about up to 120 days to maturity, and cannabis falls right within that within that bandwidth as well. 
And not surprisingly, the row crop industry is focused really primarily on yield and composition. So how much can we get per acre and what is the composition? Is it, is it the most protein? Is it the most oil? Is it the best quality oil that we can yield? And cannabis is not too dissimilar, right? So we're looking at how much, what is the maximum production that we can get from the plant, not only from a um, you know, total aerial part of the plant yield, but also what is the composition? Are we looking to get more CBD for anti-inflammatory applications? Are we looking for more THC to help with um, other medicinal applications or recreational uses that people might be searching for? And however, this is where things start to differ. So the traditional ag biotech industry has been focused on not just yield and composition, but also performance. Um, how's the plant doing in different environments? Is it able to be grown across multiple growing regions, both in the north and the su southern part of the U.S.? Um, what is its tolerance to um, different um, insect pressures or, or non or abiotic stressors, uh, lack of water, decreased nutrients? And what are the costs of those inputs? And, and also, um, Anybody who's, who's uh, familiar with agriculture will know that there's a huge issue around identity pr preservation. Um, you know, those seeds are very important commodities to the seed producers who are, are generating those plants. And of course, then there's been a huge investment in making sure that's uh, maintained and held and provides an advantage over perhaps competitors. The cannabis industry, while there's investment and interest in it, and there are some really good breeders who are, you know, have their specific lines, this investigation and interest and um, investment in understanding what the plant's tolerance is or how much does it actually cost to grow a certain amount of uh, product is really lacking. And so this is another area where I believe the agricultural biotech industry will be able to benefit um, the cannabis industry. And of course, um, the regulations are very well defined. Um, on the row crop side um, and federally and regulated at the federal level for the most part. Um, too much to get into, too much detail to get into at this point in this, in this talk here. Um, but as we were talking about earlier with this complete um, dissociation of the federal government at the state level, um, you know, as the cannabis market continues to expand and grow and develop and, and reach into other other states, this is going to be an area that the federal government will really need to take a hard look at and think about how we're regulating um, the product. So um, just taking a step back on the, a little bit more detail on how is cannabis grown. You know, germination takes about a week, seedling is about two weeks, vegetative growth is anywhere from two to eight weeks, depending on what the day length is for those plants. And then of course, the ever important flowering process. Um, up until recently, that's really been the primary objective of growers is to obtain really nice, healthy flower buds um, because that contains the most product of interest. Where cannabis differs from other crops is this curing process. And that can take anywhere from two to eight weeks. So that's slowly drying the plant down to get it to a point that it's um, not too dry, but just the right uh, point of harvest. And you don't necessarily see that with other row crops. Um, you see that with rice and wheat, they go through a drying process, but something like corn, um, soybean, it less so. The farmer might not uh, want rain or water um, his or her fields for a, a few days prior to harvest, but um, primarily that curing process is very unique to cannabis. Um, the equipment required for, for growth, um, like I was talking about earlier, some sort of nutrient delivery. Um, primarily the growth has been in warehouses and, and greenhouses, and so it's, it's been a little bit um, under the radar, but as that is becoming less of an issue, we're seeing some investment in um, a very precise amount of nutrients being delivered to each plant. Um, and then of course there are sensors, enormous amounts of sensors, both um, things that you've, you see in the traditional industry, like um, you know sensors that you actually put at the level of the soil and also drone drones that fly over to observe growth and monitor the progress. Um, in the case of when uh, supplemental lighting is needed, um, it used to be in the industry, in the cannabis industry, that LEDs were used. And this was mostly to remain under the radar and not use a large amount of um, 
electricity to power those. Um, but you see the industry is switching to high pressure sodium. This is an exact opposite of what you're seeing in agriculture. Um, LEDs have become enormously um, more diverse in the last few years using different lenses and filters. And so now you're seeing a shift in the ag biotech industry moving away from high pressure sodiums, which require an enormous amount of energy and put out a lot of heat um, to LEDs. So, well, I guess we'll figure out which one is, is the most beneficial to, to plants in general. Um, and then farmers are managing, at least from a field grown perspective, they're managing cannabis similar to, to wheat. Um, wheat's a grass, so it's mostly going to grow vertical. Um, but cannabis is, is not a grass, it's a dicot, so it's going to grow a little bit more out. But from a harvest perspective, farmers are able to make slight adaptations to their combine and go through the field and harvest it, um, similarly to wheat. And then on the, on the final harvest side, um, like I was talking about earlier, um, those, they're baling these fiber stalks. So what's left after harvesting the flowers and the leaves, um, they have found that it's quite stable for a couple of years. And while there not, might not be a use for those fiber stalks today, um, they're going, they're wrapping them and storing them for hope that, you know, even in the next couple of years that there will be a use and um, use for those, those products. And so from a farming perspective, you know, this is pretty early in the, in the, in the value chain. Um, farmers are seeing a benefit of 250 to $350 per acre. So um, to give you a counterbalance to that, farmers sometimes, at least on the operating side, it can vary quite a lot between um, 200, you know, around $200 to 300 and some odd dollars per acre. Um, but that's variable and their, you know, their actual profit per acre is more in the seven to $800 range, but they're having to pay the seed companies, they're having to pay the grain elevators and they're having to, you know, end up paying a, a lot more out of their own pocket. Um, not necessarily out of, excuse me, not out of their own pocket, but they're end up having to pay um, a lot more, um, the money, a lot more money is going through their hands and not necessarily staying with them. And so there's this incentive maybe to be a little bit more in control. They're not paying a seed company for the cannabis seeds and they're not necessarily paying a grain elevator. They're providing that directly to someone who's either going to extract it or market it um, directly to the consumer. Um, as a counterbalance though, uh, no insurance companies, no farming insurance companies are offering insurance to farmers. And this is a huge uh, risk for them. You know, farmers either, uh, whether the commodity prices are down or they're experiencing a, a, an unusual weather um, issue like hail or a late snow or an early frost. Um, if you're growing cannabis, there's no protection there. So it is a little bit of a risk. And then of course there are additional fees associated with that, um, with growing cannabis. Again, going back to that permitting process is definitely a challenge. Um, looking at it from a, just a simple greenhouse slash indoor uh, growth process, there's a, you, you, there's a direct tiered investment. So if you're going to provide a small amount of input from a climate control, and you know, nutrient input, watering and maintenance, you're going to get low yields. But interestingly, when you provide higher quality light, better nutrients, uh, more consistent care and growing conditions, you not only do you get higher yields, but you're able to fetch a little bit of a higher price because your overall production is much higher. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. So looking at the differences between outdoor and indoor growth, this is uh, flipping um, what you see mostly in agronomic performance. When you're growing plants in a greenhouse, you have a lot of control over um, you know, the sunlight the, or supplemental light and also the watering and inputs. Um, but generally yield is not necessarily better indoors, whereas currently in cannabis, um, they are seeing a, a strong benefit um, in indoor yields. And so, this goes back to the issue of cannabis hasn't been cultivated to be able to grow outside. It doesn't have a high natural insect uh, pressure tolerance, and it doesn't really appreciate going without water for a couple of days if a farmer's field is being rain fed. And so when thinking about um, how the industry is going to continue to develop, um, the, the, the cost of growing outside, of course, is low overall, right? You're not having to provide supplemental light. 
but you're having to adapt the equipment and you're going to, going to experience lower yields versus if you're going to grow indoors, um, you're going to see a, a, a better yield, but you're also going to have to put a little bit more money um, investment into the plant. And so, um, again, just thinking about it in a long-term perspective, a, a farmer who might want to be converting, you know, looking at that $350 price tag uh, of, of profit is going to have to weigh these things and going to be turning to the seed producers and saying, hey, I need a better quality seed so I can grow this outside and convert my wheat field to a cannabis field. So um, with all that negativity being said, the industry is definitely improving. Um, we're seeing a lot more investment in those processes. Um, like I was talking about earlier with the root stocks, that's a, it's a key opportunity for um, people who are um, perhaps um, moving out of the ag biotech industry and wanting to move into cannabis for one reason or another, switching jobs or, or moving for, for whatever reason. Um, there's a definite opportunity to look at um, those different um, uh, ways to improve the plant. And then, of course, um, looking at the capital fundraising, you know, um, right now it's been primarily at the, at the marketing level, at the consumer level, and we're going to see a lot of um, vertical integration of that process, um, not just from the seed, just looking at the seed and also the product, but a lot of stuff in between. You know, how can we improve the product? How can we provide... Um, you know, our, a higher level of CBD for for um, whatever application that a, a consumer might be looking for. And then using, transferring a lot of those ag biotech, um, that knowledge base from a breeding perspective, a genetic engineering perspective, a gene editing perspective, and also the using drones and adapting drones and building algorithms to, um, you know, improve growth and, and, and perhaps also, um, control a little bit more of that of that security of, of someone's product. And then, um, you know, anybody who's ever been involved in retail knows that it's all about the consumer. And so we'll see an improvement in the retail experience as well. Um, if you've ever gone into a shop, you know, it's it's uh, it's a it's a whole new experience. It's like it's like getting to, going to almost like a uh, you know an infinite uh, amount of choices. And um, so we'll continue to see that improve. Um, with a fundamental understanding of what the plan is providing. So um, where can we provide, where, where can we do a little bit better investigation? What are the areas that we can um, improve the plants and, 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 and the whole industry in general? Um, there are some, certainly a handful of companies who are doing a very good job doing some fundraising initiatives um, on some of these issues, but just to kind of give an overview of what the opportunities are, um, I was talking about soil health er earlier. That's really dependent on, um, on, on on microbial population. So there are natural bacteria and yeast that exist in the soil today. Um, we're only beginning to understand how they interact with plants and free up nutrients to make them more bioavailable to the plant and also provide um, better disease and pest resistance naturally. Um, that's also an area where many companies in the ag biotech industry are investing an enormous amount of research and understanding, um, but really you're not necessarily seeing that um, expansion yet into the cannabis industry. And what will be interesting is we're learning that on the ag biotech side is that actually has an impact on not just the plant health in itself, but also how is it, you know, how does it change the, the plant branching as it matures? Um, does it change its flowering time? Can we avoid that potential early frost? And can we improve the oil composition if we wanted to produce a plant that had higher THC or CBD or some other terpenoid of interest that we don't know is key to uh, helping a, a medical need today, but we might know it two years from now? You know, is there a microbe that can help um, impact and impart that oil composition benefit? Um, again, Traditional breeding does a very good job on the ag biotech side of Im improving different varieties um, to help with disease resistance. I won't be surprised when we come out with our first um, genetically engineered or genetically improved um, cannabis plant to help with, with drought and make that input cost lower, um, adapt the plant to be able to grow better outside and be a little bit more hardy. And then uh, a challenge with um, the cannabis industry um, is that some people just frankly, don't care for the taste or the, that sensory, those terpenes are a little bit um, 
aggravating or unsavory for them. And so and it's, it's also an oil, so it's going to have a limited shelf life um, with, with, to some extent. So how can we improve that um, in the plant at the plant level? Um, and then, uh, you know, that, that state state limitation that will obviously change the industry going forward and and how we how the united states uh, interacts with the rest of the world which you know of course there's varying um levels of acceptance um outside the u.s borders so it'll be interesting to see how that continues to expand going forward and then uh you know there there are our primary um seed biotech ag biotech industries uh companies and, and right now, the cannabis industry is quite fractionated. Um, you know, there are certainly growers who like their particular varieties and have really unique names. How are we going to continue to preserve those and, and maintain those, um, those lines going forward? Will we need to incorporate genetic markers? Will there be uh, metabolic uh, fingerprints that are unique to each plant that will be um, kind of the signature of, of the cannabis industry? And so just thinking about that in a different, uh, in a little bit more of an expansion. So um, there is a current uh, an interest in understanding how are we, you know, what is the formulation? What is that magic formulation of, of the plants and how can it be, um, be maximized? So um, for some people, it's like the duration of the relief of whatever it is that they're looking for, whether it's a it's for recreational use or whether it's for medicinal use from a social anxiety perspective or other issues that people are, are finding a use for cannabis, um, you know, how can we make that plant um, have a higher, not just a higher yield, but make it more available to the consumer as well. And then also um, looking at it from an efficiency perspective, you know, is there a way to extract it more efficiently, more efficiently at a lower cost, and and get it to the to the consumer more quickly? Um, you know, thinking about that process where the throughput is so fast right now that they're actually going to be challenged going forward to meet the demand. And so, are there ways of improving uh, the plant to market um, process so that it is? Um, uh, an easier and more a more speedy process. And again, thinking about the plant from a um, tolerance perspective, are there opportunities to integrate what we know from the ag biotech industry today with regard to um, pest tolerance, abiotic stress tolerance, um, that we can either breed into the plants um, from a variety, you know, different varieties that exist, or maybe more heirloom varieties of the plants that were a little bit perhaps less desirable from a from a palatability perspective or yield perspective, but are a little bit more hardy and can be grown outside. And then, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of really good libraries publicly available um, for a variety of crops um, through the USDA. And it wouldn't be, um, a, again, a huge surprise if we start to see that with cannabis as well, um, as investors become more interested in improving the products, it's really great to open up the uh, research field and and provide new opportunities for um, research and investment um, for to either develop libraries or improve composition and again do genetic engineering. So in summary, um, you know I think of, of cannabis uh, in an agronomic perspective. It's it's a two-way street. Um, the industry is 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 huge and enormous and there's a lot of investment in it and they're doing a lot of really interesting things. Um, but on the flip side, I think what all of the investment that will be going into cannabis will ultimately benefit the ag biotech industry as well. We're going to learn a lot about plants. It's gonna be in an accelerated rate. And what's really great about it is that there's a lot of money in there, whereas, you know, there there's, you know, Ag biotech interest, industry is not as as appealing and not as eye catching as the cannabis industry is. So it'll be really good to draw in those investors who might not have been um, as interested in ag biotech but are interested in cannabis. Draw in some extra money to to improve research and improve the products. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the cultivation practices and how it's managed today. Um, certainly, we'll continue to see an improvement in there if, if we're going to reap the benefits of being able to grow the plant outside and use natural inputs to um, provide the best yield of those plants, um, with the caveat that 
Um, there needs to be uh, a better balance of regulations. Great that it's really strict at the at the plant growth level, but perhaps at the um, up and down the value chain that needs to be it needs to be addressed. And then, um, as we continue to learn more, we'll, we'll harmonize the way that we're uh, managing those cannabis plants and production, and ultimately the products themselves, um, through either identity pres preservation or, or library um, development, so that ultimately we're providing the best product to consumers. And um, my last slide is just some references for the uh, different parts that I talked about today, and that's all I have. Um, please send me your questions. I um, am open to questions, challenges, and other things that you might want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fazio, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. As a reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.